We're going to do a real case study today. And of course, I'm not going to give you the patient's name nor show you the blood work, but I'm going to read you the numbers. And I find this interesting to do because I think when you hear this, and we do this in my group program a lot, I always tell my group participants, my patients in there, to listen when we're going over someone else's labs because it really kind of sheds a light when you're looking at your own labs and you continue to learn. So what I want to do today is actually go through a real patient, go through some of the lab values and teach as we go and let you really listen in and take notes so you can apply this to your labs as well. And then you can really realize when maybe something looked normal or you were told that it was normal and know when to really reach out for help. This particular patient has been told that she is normal by multiple, multiple doctors. And I'm not gonna give too many details, but she's very young and should not be suffering the way that she's suffering. And she should not be carrying the weight that she is carrying at such a young age. And it's unfortunate that when something is so black and white in front of us, in front of me, whenever I look at labs and, and things just paint that beautiful picture right there in front of me with numbers that so many doctors before didn't see, didn't take the time to look, didn't take the time to paint the picture. And meanwhile, People are suffering. This girl is suffering needlessly. And quite frankly, it often pisses me off, and I will say so to the patient or to the patient's parents, depending on their age and who they're with, or to the patient's family, that they were flat out wrong, that I am pissed off that no one told them what's going on because I see it. I see it right here. It's jumping off the page. And if anyone spent any amount of time with you and listened to you or looked at you, and saw the condition of your body and the health condition that you're in right now, there's no way that they would let you leave that office with a normal diagnosis. So maybe this will help some of you as well. I hope so. I hope so. So again, this patient has already been diagnosed with Hashimoto's prior. So she came to me already on medication and they called her situation pre-diabetes, but in my book, it's flat out diabetic. We have talked many times on this podcast about insulin resistance. So I'm going to jump right to the biggest number that jumps off the page and it might surprise you. It's not thyroid. It is not thyroid. It is insulin. This patient's insulin is a 57. Prior, it was a 50. Prior to that was a 24. And prior to that was a 25. Going all the way back to 2015. So it's been six years that she's been suffering. Six years that it's obvious that insulin resistance has been present. Because remember with insulin, we want it below a six. Anything above a six is insulin resistant. She has been walking around with a 25, 24, a 50, and now a 57. I can tell you all that I haven't seen an insulin level of a 57 in easily 10 years. Easily. Even the diabetic patient that I worked with who was on insulin was on insulin. Even that, his insulin was not that high. We reversed his diabetes. We brought his A1C down from a 13.9 to a 5.4 but his insulin wasn't that high, was not that high. Hemoglobin A1C, this poor girl, all the way back in 2015, it was a six. That is diabetes, folks. That is diabetes. I don't care what that standard lab value range says. That is diabetes. We want A1C between a 4.8 and a 5.1. And right now it still is a six, still. Glucose, and this is the interesting part. This is where many of you get stuck because you rely on your glucose number to see whether or not you're insulin resistant. And what do I always say? Glucose can lie. Glucose can be high in the morning because of the cortisol awakening response and glucose can come down and you can actually have a low fasting glucose and be diabetic at the same 
time. Glucose number is 90, 88, 95, 103. Okay, the 103 starts to flag me a little bit, but what about the 88? What about the 95? All the while, while insulin is literally through the roof, creating so much inflammation in the body and so much fat storage in the body that unless we bring that insulin down, no changes will be made in this person's health. No changes will be made in her body composition. This is not a total thyroid patient. This is not just optimize the thyroid and all will be well, and then the insulin will come into play. This is we need to get that insulin down in order for your thyroid to work properly. Because walking around with that high of an insulin number is dangerous. It's going to cause fat storage left and right. It's going to cause inflammation. We don't want A1Cs that high either. Now, going to the thyroid, reverse T3. I'm going to start there. We already know she has high Hashimoto, so we don't need to get into the antibodies. But reverse T3, 23.3. Before that, 23.4. Before that, 23.8. Before that, 19. What do we like reverse T3 at? Less than 12. So this is telling us that her body is in a, a literal state of survival. She is in survival mode. Her body is trying to hold on and, and keep her alive, basically, because of all that insulin in her system. And what do we always say? Insulin causes high reverse T3. We need to focus on the insulin, bring that insulin down. Surprisingly, and you're probably thinking, well, she's on too much T4 medication. She is on zero T4 medication. She is on T3 only. Does she need an increase? Yeah. We'll get to that. But we need to address the insulin or that reverse T3 will stay high. It doesn't matter how much T3 we throw at it. That reverse T3 will stay high because this is where we have to break out of the thyroid medication block. Even though you guys, you know, I love optimizing you with the right dose and the right med and getting all that straightened out. Most people respond to that. But there are certain cases where you have to dig deeper. And this is where root cause and functional medicine really comes into play because that insulin is going to keep that reverse T3 high no matter what we do, no matter what. You all know that I'm on T3 only. I'm on 150 micrograms of T3, split dose 75 and 75. If I were walking around with an elevated insulin, do you think that that T3 would make a difference? No. Would my reverse T3 be high? Yes. With no T4 in my body, that reverse T3 would be high because reverse T3 is not just a function of T4 converting to reverse T3. It's also a function of elevated insulin, estrogen dominance, low iron, which she also has, low magnesium, low iodine, which she also has, so you can see it's not just T4, T4, T4. It's about all these other causes causing that reverse T3 to go up. Free T3 is a 3.6. She's at a 3.6. She's optimal. But with that reverse T3 being so high, that T3 is not getting into the cell. It's not getting into the cell because insulin is so elevated that every cell in her body is literally inflamed. And if we look at, da, 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 I'm scrolling down, I'm scrolling down. If we look at C-reactive protein, C-reactive protein cardiac is a measure of inflammation, as is the w sed rate. So when we look at both of those, her SED rate is actually fine at a 22. The C-reactive protein on the standard lab value range of zero to three is a 7.37. So we know that there's a lot of inflammation going on and not surprising with that high insulin. Not surprising at all. Now, this is a case of polycystic ovarian syndrome. How often do I say that we see PCOS with Hashimoto's? We see insulin resistant with, with Hashimoto's. And normally my focus is on the thyroid. You thyroid at the top, balance that thyroid, 
trickle down effect, hormones start to balance out as we're working on the hormones. Sometimes we need to adjust them a little bit. Add in a little bit of Itex for the progesterone. Make sure that it doesn't go into estrogen dominant state. Make sure that testosterone doesn't go too, too high. Keep it in that nice range because PCOS patients, they like to go high on their test. But our focus has to be this time on insulin, not thyroid first, insulin first. Changing of diet, addressing the insulin, using berberine and Sensitol from Designs for Health and addressing that insulin and changing the diet, changing the diet. Now, back to the thyroid, are we going to increase, even though her free T3 is optimal, are we going to increase it a little bit? Yeah, we'll increase it a little bit because what do I always say? Your free T3 optimal might be higher than 3.5. You might be optimal at a four and you might be optimal at a five. And in fact, if we look back at her past labs, she was at a four and a 4.1 and a 4.2 and now is a 3.6. So she had optimal free T3 levels. It wasn't getting into the cell because of that constant high elevated reverse T3, constant high elevated insulin, constant high elevated hemoglobin A1C. That's the problem. That's the problem right there. And if we focus on that insulin, then everything else starts to come into play. Then the thyroid will work better. The reverse T3 will come down and the T3 that she's taking will actually get into the cell to give her a metabolism. And then everything works together. So now you have the insulin down, preferably way, 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 way down. And your body can tap into your fat stores for fuel because that insulin isn't floating around in the bloodstream causing high elevated glucose. And in her case, not too high elevated glucose, but that insulin is high. High insulin, insulin resistance will cause fat storage, will cause inflammation, will cause elevated reverse T3. But as she starts to bring down the insulin and lose weight, then the thyroid medication works better, gets into the cell, gives her more of a metabolism. We're addressing the iron at the same time because don't want her anemic. We're addressing that low progesterone because you shouldn't have progesterone of a postmenopausal female if you're young. We're addressing anything with the estrogen, although she's not in an estrogen dominant state right now, so that's fine. It's mainly the insulin, the hemoglobin A1C, the iron and ferritin, and last but not least, the liver. Liver, 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 liver. Alkaline phosphatase, AST, ALT, that's what you look at on your labs. And if they are elevated, that's a problem. If even one of them is elevated, that's a liver problem. Everything gets processed through the liver. Toxins get processed through the liver. Hormones get processed in the liver. If your liver is jammed up and clogged and not working properly and not methylating hormones, you're going to have a backup. You might have elevated testosterone. You might get into a PCOS state. This also equals fatty liver disease, so high insulin. We often see elevated liver enzymes because that becomes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And that non-alcoholic fatty liver will hinder the methylation of hormones. So it's very easy to get into an estrogen dominant state if your liver isn't processing because the liver can't get rid of the estrogen. So it hangs out and it hangs on. And you go into that estrogen dominant state, which just perpetuates the weight gain because estrogen dominance is going to cause weight gain and water retention. And you're going to be miserable and moody. And it's going to push down your progesterone. And if you're a guy, it's going to push down your testosterone. Even if you're a girl, it might push down your testosterone unless you have PCOS. And then the testosterone is too high. So you're in this hormonal disarray because your poor liver can't process and, and methylate hormones. That's not a good place to be. So in this situation, we use the detox support pack. And I'll put all this in the show notes too for you. We use the detox support packets from Designs for Health. And they, those come in a pack of 60. I always say, listen, I don't care whether your liver enzymes are elevated or not, you need to be doing some kind of liver detox. I'm not going to say cleanse because everybody thinks that you're going to poop. You need to do a liver detox once a quarter, every time the seasons change. So that could, the detox support packets come in a pack of 60. You're going to use 30 of them this month, and then you use another 30, three, four months from now. 
when the seasons change. That supports liver detoxification, both pathways, phase two and phase, phase one and phase two detox pathways. Also supports your gallbladder. Detox support packets, berberine and sensitol for that high of insulin, both, both, both. FemGuard plus balance, because she's having heavy, irregular periods that goes hand in hand with PCOS. And in that FemGuard is a little bit of chase berry, which will bring up that low postmenopausal progesterone that she should not have. And that will greatly balance out. FemGuard plus balance is also great for women with hot flashes. So it's great for PCOS, young women, heavy periods, um, uh, irregular periods, PCOS and hot flashes. That FemGuard plus balance is the bomb. And you know what? Designs for Health is the bomb. Did I tell you guys this story? I know this is totally sidetracking off our topic here, but did I tell you the story when they were out of FemGuard? I don't, it was sometime during the whole pandemic. And I called the company and I said, you know, all, the, all, all my patients are asking for it. There's nothing else on the market like it. And they said, we got in one ingredient and we quality tested it and it didn't meet our quality standards. So we didn't produce it. I said, that's just one ingredient out of like the 10 that's in there. How many companies would have put that in anyways with the less than stellar ingredients? And then on top of that, they lost millions. I mean, it was out of stock for a good four months. They lost millions. That company lost millions, but put quality over money. So kudos to Designs for Health for that. So FemGuard Plus Balance, Berberine, uh, Sensitol, the detox support packets for sure. And then of course, we also see low iodine and low vitamin D. Now low vitamin D does play a role. I know I said last but not least with the liver, but there's two other things. So low vitamin D is tied in the medical literature to an increased risk of diabetes Obesity, insulin resistance, hormonal imbalance. It also plays a huge role in your immune system. Every cell in your body needs vitamin D, every single cell. Every cell in your body needs iodine. Hello, in comes iodine. So we also have our own iodine because elevated reverse T3, low iodine. Inflammation, low iodine. Thyroid not working, low iodine. Every cell in your body needs iodine. Fibrocystic breasts, iodine. Immune system, iodine. You can nebulize iodine for anything going around that begins with a C or, you know, just the flu and a cold. Nebulize some iodine. It kills everything. It's great. It's amazing. And every single cell in your body needs it. So we're using iodine. We're using high-dose vitamin D, 10,000 I use per day to get that vitamin D from a 36 to an 80. Zinc look good, selenium look good, copper look good, zinc copper ratio look good, cortisol was good. So everything else we were pretty darn good on. But those, those factors that we just talked about today, I hope you learn a lot from this conversation because I think diving into individual case studies like this, and I'll do this whenever I have something really interesting come up something a little bit different, another little twist for you guys to, to listen and learn from. Going over labs and listen, she didn't do a Dutch test. There was no big, fancy, expensive. This is blood. This is just straight up blood work. And there it is in black and white. Didn't need to spend extra on functional testing. Here it is right in front of us. Multiple doctors missed it, but we're going to get her fixed up give her her young life back so she can start now living and feeling good about herself and not walk around inflamed and overweight and tired and depressed. That's no way to live. And remember with that T3, the brain has receptor sites on it for T3. Feeling down, all this depression that we have in our teenagers these days, yeah, it's part social media and part the state of the world but how's their thyroid? Are they inflamed? Are they eating the standard American diet processed garbage food that's jacking their insulin up? And then that beautiful T3 can't get to their brain. So they get stuck on antidepressants when really all they need is to pull out that bad food, lower their insulin so their thyroid can work well. So the T3 can get to the brain where it should. 
I bet you there's a lot of not even diagnosed yet Hashimoto's and hypothyroid kids that they're slapping on Adderall and Ritalin and antidepressants at the age of 15, 16, 17, 18, and they really should be checking their thyroid. They really should be checking their insulin levels. They really should be changing up their diet. If we do that, we can see a whole change in our kids' health. That's another podcast for another day. I hope you enjoyed this one though and got something out of it. Like I said, we'll put the list of links to the supplements down in the show notes.